if you watched my brioche quest part one i'm sure you couldn't sleep for a month wondering how the story ends well today's the day of the brioche quest finale and tutorial after my lesson with valerie i had a brioche procedure that worked but i also had many questions do i have to use european butter do i need three types of flour does the pan make a difference and many more. So I started baking batch after batch of brioche, changing only one variable at a time until I got all the answers I was looking for and gained 10 pounds. <laughs> Let's start with these questions because they will come in very handy for the tutorial. Is SAF yeast really immortal? If you recall the day of my lesson, I made the dough following Valerie's recipe and brought it to her house to bake the next day. One interesting thing we noticed was that my dough was proofing a lot slower than Valerie's. Valerie asked me how old my yeast was and I told her, I don't know, somewhere between three and four years. She said, what? I change mine every six months. All my baking resources and even Stella Parks suggested that SAF yeast can last several years if kept cold. So the next day, I whipped up another batch of brioche with brand new SAF instant yeast and sure enough, it rose a lot faster. So it's probably a good idea to change your yeast maybe, I don't know, once a year, <laughs> move a small amount into a container so that you don't have to open the bag that often and keep both the bag and container in the fridge. Is European butter necessary? Okay, so once I was able to recreate Valerie's brioche completely independently using my own oven, I decided to try it with American butter. Not only that, but generic brand American butter. And it worked. In terms of texture, everything was fine. It was very hard uh, for me to tell if there was a slight difference in flavor. Maybe some people could tell the difference. I personally couldn't. Basically, any butter produces good brioche. I think if you are practicing, it might be easier to use American butter. But if you're making brioche for a special occasion, you might want to try European style butter. Which flour should I use? Okay, so Valerie's brioche uses three flours, 340 grams of bread flour, 40 grams of all-purpose flour, and 20 grams of cake flour. I tried replacing 20 grams of cake flour with all-purpose and nothing bad happened. I figured everyone has all-purpose flour, but not everyone has cake flour. I do like bread flour for brioche that has a very high fat content like this one, so I didn't play with replacing that. I know there are brioche recipes that use only all-purpose, but they don't contain as much butter and don't need as much help with gluten development. How do I adapt the kneading procedure to a C-hook? Here is something I find interesting. Almost every single recipe developer that I know has a KitchenAid with a bowl lift and a spiral hook. Just watch any cooking show. They all use KitchenAid Pro. But what most home cooks have is KitchenAid Classic or Artisan, and both of those come with a C-hook. It needs completely differently. Yes, it can work just fine, but it requires lots and lots of thorough dough scraping and rearranging, and most brioche recipes don't warn you about that. After my mixer is done with the dough, I usually finish it by hand, just in case, for a couple of minutes. I'll show you how to do it in the tutorial, but I've also tested this recipe without finishing by hand. I just gave the dough one more scrape down and rearranging, and it worked fine. So if kneading super wet and sticky doughs is freaking you out, understandably, that's not a showstopper. You can still make this dough. Which pan should I use? After my lesson with Valerie, I bought the exact same pan that she had, and that's what I've been baking in ever since. Here, let me show you. Here it is. Once I was getting consistent results and knew that my dough was not what was causing my problems, I tried my old pan. There it is. And guess what? the sides got sucked in. So while I was trying to change my kneading, my proofing, my baking, and my shaping, all I really needed to change 
was my pan. <laughs> To be fair, the sides pull in a little, even in my new low and white pan. That seems to be normal. It's a very delicate bread and it grows like no other bread I know, probably because it has both yeast and eggs. So making something that's way taller than wider is asking for trouble. I know what you're thinking. What about panettone? Isn't that tall? Uh, but panettone are prone to collapse and they're usually stabbed with skewers as soon as they are out of the oven and hung upside down to prevent that. In a metal pan, that's not an option. So choose low wide pans. Mine is nine by four and a half by two and three quarters of an inch. I'll link to it below. Don't be fooled by the low height. Brioche rises so much, you'll get a very tall loaf. How much should I proof? When I was having my shrinking problems, most bakers who tried to help me thought I might be overproofing. That wasn't the problem at all. Since brioche is shaped straight out of the fridge, expect very long proofing times. If you can create a warm and humid place that's close to 80 Fahrenheit, expect a large loaf like the one we're baking today to rise for a couple of hours. If you're leaving it to its own devices at room temperature, it can take as long as five hours if your house is cold. People often say the dough should double. If you only look at the height, that might be accurate. But if you're looking at volume, you want it to be more like tripled. If your crumb comes out dense with a few large holes, that's a sign that you haven't proofed enough. By the way, all the proofing tests that I've seen like you poke the dough and check how quickly it fills back in are BS in my opinion. Several professional bakers, including Valerie, that I asked said they don't do that because it's completely unreliable. They, you know, these tests work as well as testing a steak for dentist by touching it. The best way to learn to proof the dough enough is to use a very precise pen size and to weigh how much dough you put into it. When the dough reaches the top, you know you're ready to bake. How do I know when it's baked through? Another suggestion I was getting a lot was to bake longer. So I kept baking longer and longer and my brioche was getting drier and drier, but no more stable. Brioche is not like most other breads. Most breads are done between 200 and 210 Fahrenheit. Brioche is done between 180 and 190 Fahrenheit. That being said, I find that thermometers aren't very accurate when you stick them into super airy breads. I much prefer the knife test. If the knife comes out clean and your brioche is deeply brown, you're done. The only other words of wisdom that I have for you is to watch the video on measuring ingredients for baking before starting. And if you haven't baked any yeast breads before, you might want to start with this milk bread rolls. Link is right here. They taste very similar to brioche, but are much easier to get right. Okay, are you ready? Let's make brioche! Weigh out all your ingredients. There is a list in the description below and then put them into the bowl of a stand mixer in this order. 6.25 grams of SAF instant yeast, 50 grams of whole milk straight from the fridge, 40 grams of granulated sugar, 340 grams of bread flour and 60 grams of all-purpose flour, 220 gram eggs, that's about four extra large straight from the fridge and 8.4 grams of salt. Oil the dough hook with canola or some other neutral oil. This will help with scraping things down. Run the mixer on the lowest speed for five minutes. Yes, you should use a timer. To get the right consistency, this dough requires a very long mixing. Cranking up the speed will not develop more gluten. It will just develop more friction, which will overheat your dough. While your dough is mixing, get 200 grams of unsalted butter out of the fridge and cut it into half inch cubes. I've tried all different ways to add butter, like beating it and smearing it. And this one is by far the fastest. After the butter is cut up, leave it at room temperature. By the time you add it to the dough, it should be cold but squishable. After the first five minutes, stop the mixer. Oil a large spoon or spatula and scrape all the dough from the hook. 
This is super not fun, the spiral dough hook. People don't need to do this, but the C hook people need to take the step very seriously, at least if they want decent results. After you scrape the hook, you need to flip the dough in the bowl. Yes, it will be sticky and very difficult to flip, but it's you versus this lump. So show it who's the boss. From now on, I'll refer to this procedure of scrape the hook, scrape the bowl, and flip the dough as just scrape. Mix on the lowest speed for three more minutes. And scrape. Mix on the lowest speed for two more minutes. See how stretchy my dough is getting? At this stage, you should develop enough gluten and it's safe to start adding the butter. But first, scrape. By the way, this whole flipping business is a lot easier if you remove the bowl from the mixer. But I didn't want to move my camera, so I had to remove the hook to make it work. I find that the butter integrates a lot faster if I give each cube a little squish and add it one at a time while running the mixer on the lowest speed. Start with half the butter. It will take one to two minutes for it to get completely absorbed. Don't worry about one or two tiny pieces. Do the scrape. <laughs> Restart the mixer on the lowest speed and add the second half of butter, squishing each piece. Wait for all the butter to get completely integrated and you know it's coming. Scrape. In fact, I think we should have a drinking game where you take a drink every time I say scrape in this video. And now, are you ready for some serious action? We're going to run the mixer not on the lowest speed, but on medium speed and beat the heck out of this dough, which will give us a very airy crumb. On KitchenAid, you want speed four for four minutes. After four minutes, scrape. It shouldn't be nearly as difficult now because the dough should become much more elastic and way less sticky. Mix on medium speed for two more minutes. By the end, the dough should be very, very, very stretchy. You know Kipling's story about a curious little elephant that got his trunk stretched out by the alligator? That's what you should end up with. In the end, you want your dough to be between 71 and 77 Fahrenheit. Given all the heat created by friction during the last 25 minutes, this temperature is only possible if you start with cold ingredients. If you want to finish your dough by hand, here is how it works. Pick up the dough with the fingers underneath and the thumbs on top. Smack it down and fold away from you. Pick it up from the side. Smack and fold away. Pick up, smack, fold. Pick up, smack, fold. By the time I get my dough out of the mixer, it has developed so much gluten that it isn't sticky. But if you get it out earlier and experience some stickiness, use a pastry scraper to help you pick it up. Put a tiny bit of flour into the bottom of a two-quart bowl. Bigger is fine, smaller is not. Flour the top and sides of your dough a tiny little bit and place it in the bowl smooth side up. Cover with plastic and if you want to let it rise at room temperature, cover it with a towel to protect it from drafts. But since my kitchen is very cold right now, I'm going to use my instant pot. I filled it with 77 Fahrenheit water, but I won't turn it on since no setting, not even the lowest yogurt setting is low enough. I'm just using it as a thermos because it's insulated. You can also put a pan of hot water on the bottom of the oven and place your dough on the middle rack to create a warm and cozy place. Depending on how cold your kitchen is, you might want to rewarm the water after an hour or two if you want to be done with rising in three hours. But it's totally fine if you want to let your dough rise longer at a lower temperature. Here we are after three hours. If you're using a two-quart bowl, the dough should fill it completely. Lightly oil a two-quart container. Though if you don't need your bowl back, you can just reuse that. Using a spoon or spatula, unstick the dough from the sides and flip it out onto barely floured counter so that the smooth side is now underneath. Stretch it into a big rectangle. 
and smash any bubbles that you find. Fold it like a letter into thirds. Pat it flat. Stretch it to make it a little wider and fold it into thirds again. If you keep finding bubbles, squish them. Place the dough into the oiled container or bowl, smooth side up. Press a piece of plastic wrap directly on top of the dough. This will prevent it from drying up and forming a skin. Cover the container with a lid and refrigerate it overnight or up to four days. While sitting in the fridge, your dough will double again and will become very firm. That's totally normal and will make shaping a lot easier. Get the dough out of the container and onto a very lightly floured work surface. With lightly floured hands, pat it flat, getting as many bubbles out as you can. There are many shapes you can make out of brioche, but today I'll show you a classic called brioche nanterre. It's a large loaf made out of balls. For our 9 by 4.5 by 2 and 3 quarter inch pan, we'll need 8 balls of dough, 80 grams each. Cut the dough with a pastry scraper and weigh each piece. You might need to subtract some dough or add some dough until you get to 80 grams. If you're off by 1 or 2 grams, don't worry about it. After you cut your 8 pieces, you'll have about 140 grams of dough left that you can use to make individual buns or whatever your heart desires. Wrap it very tightly in plastic and put it back in the fridge if you don't want to use it right away. Working on a lightly floured surface with lightly floured hands, flatten each piece of dough with the back of your palm. Fold all the edges towards the center. Be careful not to trap any flour inside. If you see any unabsorbed flour, brush it off. Keep folding until all the dough meets in the middle like a dumpling. Then flip it over and roll it with your hand. At first, you want to extend your fingers to help you press very hard on the ball and apply a lot of pressure. But as you feel the ball form, you make your hand more rounded and lighten up the pressure. Your ball should be completely smooth on the top and sealed on the bottom. Let's do another one. If the dough is sticking, add a bit more flour. Push all the edges into the middle. Push, push, push. Here's my dumpling. Flip it over and roll. Flat fingers, rounded fingers, and then. If your dough is sliding around when you try to roll it, you either need to remove some flour or press harder, or both. Grease your loaf pan with butter and put the dough balls into it smooth side up. You'll have two rows of four and they'll be snug as a bug in a rug, so getting the last one is, is not trivial. Press down gently on them so that they fill the bottom nicely. Cover them with plastic and leave in a warm and humid place to rise. You want around 78 Fahrenheit. In my cold kitchen, this means an oven with a pan of boiling water on the bottom and the loaf pan on the middle rack. Check them after one and a half hours, but don't be surprised if it takes two to five hours depending on the ambient temperature. When the buns just start to be visible when your eyes are level with the top of the pan, it's time to preheat your oven to 350 Fahrenheit. Leave them at room temperature, but keep them covered with plastic during the 15 minutes or so that it takes your oven to preheat. About the ovens. Turns out mine runs hot. So to get 350 Fahrenheit, I need to set it to 325 Fahrenheit. So you might want to get an oven thermometer or just experiment to see what temperature works best in your oven. To make the egg wash, I use one yolk and roughly two thirds of an egg white plus one tablespoon of whole milk. Feel free to eyeball all this. Unlike the dough, you don't need to be precise with the egg wash. Beat them together until homogeneous. When the oven is preheated, brush the buns with egg wash. I start by dabbing the wash on top of each bun and then I carefully work my way into all the crevices. 
Be gentle since they're very fragile at this point and be careful not to drip the egg into the pan. Place your loaf in the middle of the oven and turn on convection fan if you have it. Start checking at 25 minutes, but don't be surprised if you need a bit more time, especially without convection. Two things need to happen for you to be done. The brioche should be nicely browned and the knife that is stabbed all the way to the bottom, right through the center of the loaf, should come out clean. You want the dough between the buns to get a hint of color too. Uh, it won't be brown, but if it's snow white, give it another minute or two. Cool the brioche in the pan for five minutes and then carefully tip it out onto a rack. There it is in all its glory. It's totally normal for the top to deflate slightly and for the sides to pull in just a bit. Nothing should be falling or collapsing, but it won't look like a blown up balloon the way it did when it came out of the oven. Now you have to wait for at least an hour. The flavor, the texture, everything will be better once it cools. Make sure to use a serrated knife so that you don't compress the delicate crumb. Oh, look at all those little holes! By the way, if your sides end up a little wrinkled and slightly sagging, so are mine. I think we're so used to Instagram pictures that only show the attractive side of food that it creates unrealistic ex expectations. <laughs> now that I showed you the ugly side, let me show you the pretty side too. It's like a featherlight buttery lace. Need I say more? Here are more obsessively detailed cooking tutorials for you to check out. And if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.